study the Bible. Um, that's really what it is anymore. We've stopped doing topical things, and we're much more into Bible study. So this is really Rex's Bible study minute. Um, we are in Revelation chapter 8. Uh, this is the 16th week of this study of Revelation. We've got a long way to go as well, but uh, I hope this study has been encouraging to you. It's It's been both encouraging and uh, stressful <laughs> on my end of things. The book of Revelation is difficult, um, and today we're going to kind of talk about why it's so difficult a little bit as we study Revelation 8, verses 6 through 13, uh, the end of the the end of chapter 8. So let's go ahead and read it, um, and then we'll get into it. So uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets got ready to blow them. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burnt up, a third of the trees were burnt up, and so was every blade of green grass. And then the second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain flaming with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of all living sea creatures died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a huge star burning like a torch fell from the sky, falling on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Poisonwood, or Wormwood, depending on your translation. A third of the waters turned to poison, and many people died because of the waters that had become bitter. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light would be darkened, with a third of the day losing its light, and a third of the night as well. I looked, and I heard a lone eagle flying in mid-heaven, and calling out loudly, Woe, woe, woe to the earth dwellers, it called, because the sound of the other trumpets that the last three angels are going to blow. So we are very much in the middle section of Revelation. Um, this is the section where things get a little crazy. Um, things aren't portrayed very clearly. Uh, and so as we study this, I, I, I kind of want to do a recap of, of how we're supposed to approach Revelation. How we're supposed to approach the Bible in general. Like this is one of those things that we have to, as Christians or people who study the Bible, we have to make sure we're intentional about it. Because when you are raised in the church, let's talk to you guys first. If you're raised in the church, you're taught the Bible means certain things. That the way you understand certain parts of the Bible, you're taught that this is the right way and this is the wrong way. And depending on where you're raised, what kind of church you're raised in, there are certain things that you disagree with on other folks. Some churches, some branches of, of the Christian umbrella, they really emphasize end times. They'll say it means exactly this, this is exactly how it's going to happen. Others, it's just not taught at all, and you don't know what to think. But the point is, we come into studying the Bible, if you were raised in church, with a ton of preconceived notions. And so, it's important that we, as people who study the Bible, step back every once in a while and kind of give ourselves a litmus test. Why do we believe what we believe? Why do we think things we do about the Bible? And Revelation is one of those things that either you, you have that, that preconceived, it was said, this is the exact right way to understand it, or you have the I don't understand it at all notion. Either way, you have to step back from the things of the Bible, especially Revelation, and try to understand them as the first century readers would have understood them, or whatever century it was. If you read the Old Testament, you got a little bit earlier than that. But when we look at the first century, we see a time period that is full of drastic changes within the Roman Empire. I mean, right before the first century of Julius Caesar, and then you have the, the empire transition from a republic to a true empire. You have it turned into to a, a ruled by emperors. Um, and you see throughout the first century, you see people like Nero um, who come in and they just they upheave everything. They, they bring chaos. You see the civil wars that happen as a result of them. You see the, the very quick turnover in, in the emperor's position. You see all these things, drastic changes in social structures. You see drastic changes in the economy. You see drastic changes in religion. You see all this kind of chaos happen very quickly in the first century. And it's, it's kind of especially concentrated in the Middle East around Palestine. We see in that first century, the temple be destroyed. We see it's destroyed during a year where there were four emperors, right? Like you see like these three come in and the fourth one comes in into Vespasian and he lays behind his top general uh, uh, Titus to come and he levels Jerusalem and it's just like it's this period where there's just utter chaos. And, and as the first century goes along, there's more and more hostility towards Christians. 
And so we have to remember that that is who John is writing to. Like he sees this vision. Jesus gives John a vision. But that vision is given for those first century readers first and foremost. Yes, it was intended to be passed along throughout the centuries for us as well. But the way that John wrote down what he saw, he had people in mind. He had people in mind who he thought would understand things. He understood their perspective, their worldview, their culture. He understood all those things, and he wrote this letter in a way that it would mean something to them. That's where I think a lot of people make a big mistake when it comes to studying Revelation or really any part of the Bible is they try to put their own meanings into it instead of saying, how would the original readers have understood this? How would the people that the author was writing to understood this? Revelation is a very confusing book, but it makes a lot more sense if you put yourself back in that first century Christian under Roman rule, seeing the suffering of your friends, your family, losing property, losing jobs, all this, the hardships that they faced. If you put yourself back in their shoes, you look at the political climate they faced, you look at all the things that we know about them, and Revelation makes a lot more sense. And so we see today that, that the John transitions to another one of the septenaries. We talked about this before. Septenary is a fancy word that means a collection of seven. And they're usually broken down in a three pl- or four plus three rule. Right? So we had the seven seals on the scroll. And we saw the first four were evil being exposed, being let loose. And then we had five and six were, were evil being purged, being cured. And then the seventh was when things were finally made right. And then the vision starts over again. And that's what we see today. We see these trumpets. Like if you remember from last week, you saw that we had the seven archangels given trumpets ready to blow. We had the song. We had the ceremony just like we saw at the beginning of the first septenary, the the seals. We see there that this is about to go again. This is the same vision from a different perspective. And it makes a lot of sense with the people that John was writing to. He's writing to people who considered themselves Jewish. They weren't all Jewish originally. A lot of them were Gentile in background, but they considered themselves Jewish. That that doesn't also mean that they kept the law. It just means that they believed Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, and so they were adopting a Jewish worldview in a sense. They didn't have to become Jewish, but they viewed themselves as part of the greater Jewish religion, the worship of Yahweh, that Jesus was the Messiah that they had been waiting on, that the Jews had been waiting on for centuries, and the Gentiles were grafted into And so we see that they inherit the tradition of the the exodus, of the ten plagues. And we see that these these, these angels, they blow trumpets. And and what we see is kind of a parallel to that ten plagues story. We see rivers turned into blood. We see the death of living creatures. We see the, the, the moon blocking down the moon. Like We see all these things that are very similar to the ten plagues. And over and over we see them. John uses the same kind of proportion. Right? He says a third of blank was destroyed. A third of blank was wiped out. A third of blank were poisoned. A third of, like we see a third. Remember that this is supposed to be symbolic. That these aren't literal events. This is seeing the same vision as we saw with the seven uh, seals on the scroll. Here we see the seven trumpets being blown. And you see that in the first four trumpets, there's utter chaos. There's destruction. There is evil being let loose. That's what we see today. But then we see in verse 13, he says, Then I look and I heard a lone eagle flying mid heaven, calling out loudly, Whoa, 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 to the earth dwellers, because of the sound of the trumpets that are the last three angels are going to blow. We see the first four evil is exposed. We see that there's going to be chaos, that there's going to be upheaval, that the world is going to be absolutely rocked to its core. But not all of it. Right? That's what a third means. A third means it's not going to be all of it. It's not going to be total destruction, that there will be survivors, that there will be things that survive through it. But the last three, that is where God purges evil. That is, that is the pattern that these septenaries follow. First three, evil is let loose. Last three, evil is cured. And so that's basically what I want to get out of today. There's not a whole lot to break down in uh, this passage because it, it is what it is. Like we don't have all the details, but we know that that first century reader would have understood a lot of it, that that first century Jewish person would have seen the parallels to the plagues. But we really just, we see that, that this is just the same thing we saw in the seals, that there's going to be evil exposed that God is going to cure. It's going to be violent. 
It's going to be scary. It's going to be difficult times. There's going to be a lot of change and upheaval. But in the end, God's going to make all things right. So if you have any questions um, or, or concerns, please reach out to me. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.